Hey, Robert, it's great to have you with us here today. I'm so pleased to have you on the podcast. I know we've been talking about it for a little bit, and you and I, you know, we've had some really fun conversations about investing and about really, yeah. asset protection and about, you know, uh, smart experts and, you know, who do you go to for advice and who do you have help vet deals? And, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed our friendship. Um, I'd love for you to share. Yeah, I'd love for you to share with with uh, our listeners uh, what you're working on right now that you're excited about. What's new? What's exciting? What's going on in your world? Okay, so uh, uh, so of course we're all in the middle of the pandemic here, which has caused um, um, things to slow down, and um, and uh, and it's been been hard, I think, for for everybody. Um, and certainly catastrophic for, for a lot of people. Um, so that does cast a pal over, uh, over things. Um, but uh, we're doing our best. I mean, right and nowadays, I'm spending most of my time uh, on asset management. I own a uh, software company, uh, which is um, really being run by a phenomenally talented person and team of people. Um, and I think probably the more I get involved with that, the more damage I do, the more negative value I create. So I try to minimize my, my involvement in that. Um, the, uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, um, you know, it's interesting. I think this happens with a lot of, um, I mean, I've been investing for a long time, but it's still, it, it's not easy uh, to do, in my opinion, uh, in my experience. And I think a lot of, I don't know if I speak, speak for others, but I know I speak for at least some people who have been in a business for a long time. They feel like they know it well, that they can create value, that they can make things happen. And then, um, you know, after um, a certain number of decades, let's say, where a lot of people might switch their focus to look, managing their assets, um, you know, have the assumption that, oh, well, it's just going to be like, the running a business that I'm familiar with, and it's going to be not easy, but it's, you know, magic's going to happen, the fireworks are going to go, and so forth, and uh, and I think it's it's harder, the kinds of returns um, that one gets as an entrepreneur and in, in running an operating company, owning an operating company, um, uh, that one has experienced doing, it's very hard to switch to being sort of a passive or semi-passive investor. The returns go down. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but uh, the returns go down. And this happens actually a lot with, um, you know, I've seen this a lot with people who have a business for a long time. They sell their business thinking, oh, gee, I'm, my life's going to be great. I'll have all this cash. And they actually find that they're working just as hard <laughs> in making that cash work for them than they did before they sold the business. So it sort of defeated the purpose of selling their business. And it's, uh, so anyway, it's just a general observation. I love it. Uh, and, and, and really, it, it's, it's a, a really cool thing. I mean, I want to say great job to you. You've been able to build a business and remove yourself. So first of all, most entrepreneurs never even get to the point that their business takes off and succeeds. Secondly, you were able to do that and you were able to build a team, which when someone is able to get their business to work, they're often not good at building and managing a team uh, or even knowing how to do that or knowing when to do that. And then from there, it's even a smaller sliver that can actually remove themselves completely from the operation and have it function at a high level without them. So really, it's kudos to you and uh, great job. But I think you nailed it on the head that there is a huge difference between entrepreneurs and investors. And you know, we, we just talked about this the other day too, that uh, the skill set to be a great entrepreneur is completely different than the skill set to be a great investor. And yes. so that's why you have so many investors that um, you know, probably aren't gonna succeed as an entrepreneur and so many entrepreneurs that aren't gonna succeed as an investor. And to bridge that gap, it just, it's tough. It takes time. It, it takes time, it's really hard. Or you accept yeah. a little return. Uh, yeah, which, which is fine for some people. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, I see this a lot because uh, as you know, uh, I coach a lot of um, very successful high net worth individuals and I, I teach them how to create cash flow from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead of spending through their principal to create cash flow so that they don't ever dip into their principal. But the number one thing I see is entrepreneurs that try to invest, they lose a whole ton of money. And uh, they're in a, a much worse situation because they didn't master the skill set of investing. 
So to me, it's admirable when you have someone like you that is a strong entrepreneur that can build a business, but then you've also bridged that gap. You are like the smallest percentage, you know, you're, you're less than, you know, half a percent, you know, you're probably 0.01% of people that can actually do both successfully. I'd love to know what your secret is and, and why you feel you've had success in both. Uh, well, the, big, the biggest secret is, is luck. Uh, in that, um, at least as an entrepreneur, I mean, entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is incredibly risky. Uh, the I've never hit any big home runs, uh, but I've hit some kind of singles, one after the other. And I think what's very, uh, you know, that's un, that's uncommon. It's mostly luck, and I can tell you, you know, stories uh, that support the notion that it, that it's luck, um, largely luck. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it's very hard, the, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, um, uh, have incredible talent. And if you get wiped out one time, if you go 10 or 20 years later, then you get wiped out and you have to start over again. That's really tough. It's really hard to build assets that way, but that's what happens a lot of time because you, uh, you know, I had a company, for example, that I sold, uh, you know, not knowing that the the financial price was going to happen, but it happened to sell in October of 2007. If I had, if it didn't sell, if that buyer happened to not come around and it was a year later um, or no buyer came around at all, um, you know, that business probably would have gone out of business and I been, would have been wiped out because I guaranteed debt to, to acquire the company and so forth. So that's just one example. I think one thing that, uh, that I feel did help me and can help others is that if, um, and this is a reason for investing education early in life, uh, because I had the experience of losing money in, uh, you know, for me at the time, you know, when I was 21 years old, it was a lot of money. And, um, and so having had the experience of, of losing, you know, being overconfident, which a lot of people are both in entrepreneurship and in investing, but then once you've had, you, you've been humbled a few times, and it's better, I think, to be humbled early in life when uh, maybe the dollar amounts are smaller, the stakes are smaller than to have, it's almost worse to have a string of successes early in life and then your disaster happens. You get overconfident, then your disaster happens with a larger amount of money or where the stakes are higher. That's almost worse than suffering defeat and, and loss early on. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I also had a similar situation where my first investment ended up losing me money. And so I, I feel like I sobered up real quick on the investment, uh, play, you know, just the framework of what I need to do and that I'm doing it wrong and I need to get a little more education there. So uh, I think that's so cool. You know, your backstory is really interesting. Um, you know, I had the, the privilege of kind of learning about your father and your grandfather and, you know, kind of the... Uh, the family tree that you came from. I, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share some of that because I, I wonder if part of that uh, lineage has helped shape who you are and maybe even has, you know, lit a fire under you to uh, do some great things with your life. Um, uh, well, it certainly has, has had some influence. Uh, my father and my grandfather both uh, worked uh, for large corporations, and, uh, and they, they, had, they had good careers, and they uh, contributed a lot to the companies they, uh, they worked for. Um, and I think generally they had, they had pretty good lives. They, they worked really hard, uh, and, um, uh, and, um, and at certain points in their lives, they sort of came to the realization um, that uh, you know investing is is, is important um, as as a way to generate lifestyle and better to start early you know because just because of compounding for um, uh, and other reasons um, and so it was interesting my uh, I remember when I was sixteen uh, my grandfather said you know he proposed to me this game where and this is before the internet where I would invest ten thousand dollars of fake money in the stock market and I had to send him a letter and it had to be postmarked on Thursday and he would check the postmark and I would say what socks I would buy with the imaginary $10,000 and which ones I would sell. And the deal was is that I would do it for a year and if I lost money, you know, nothing would happen. But if I gained money, he would write me a check for whatever the gain is. Um, and I mean, that really is, I would say it's not investing, it's really more of a game. 
Uh, and for me, I was never into sports, either playing them or in professional sports as a spectator. And so maybe this was my substitute for, you know, my lack of interest in professional sports, that this was really a fun game. And, and it so happened uh, that I started doing it in August of 1982, which was the start of this enormous bull market. Uh, so my portfolio was up uh, just by sheer luck, actually, 60 percent. Uh, and so that was very motivating uh, for me. And, you know, part of what I feel that the, you know, you're not going to, as a, as a kid or really anybody, you're not going to really uh, develop a, much of a skill for anything in one year. But if you can develop an enthusiasm for it, um, that, at least for me, it kept me going uh, to the point where I actually could develop some skill. <laughs> and uh, because it, it takes multiple years. Um, however, you know, one year, the results of investing in one year, it's really whether you do well or not, it's total luck or 99% luck or 90% luck. Um, so I don't know if, if really uh, that, that game is such, you know, I'm, with my daughter, I'm doing something a little different uh, for that reason. But, you know, so it happened to be lucky, it developed enthusiasm, and then that led to, um, you know, I was fortunate when I went to college, um, uh, my parents had, um, had uh, tuition money for me. And they basically, rather than just paying the term bills, they actually gave me the money uh, and said, okay, you're responsible for paying your own tuition. If you can earn money through investing on this money, then that's, that'll help you. I think maybe they had, there was three years worth of college and I needed four years or something like that. So that, you know, you can, you know, and if you make beyond that, you'll have extra spending money. So I thought that was pretty cool. So it gave me an extra four years during college of uh, investing. And then, um, and then investing, so investing started with a game and then it became a way to pay college tuition. And then after that, it became a social experience because I joined an investment club and only then did it become sort of a lifestyle type thing. So I think it progressed in different forms. I just think it's so cool how your family equipped you so that instead of having money be this thing that's like super divisive and that you're, you, you have this scarcity mindset around like, oh no, I'm going to you know, what if I lose it all and you grip it so tight, your, your whole like framework around it is this is cool. This is fun. This is a game. This is an opportunity for me to make more. And I just think that that's tremendous. And, and what a great education, what a great experience we can pass on to our children and to, you know, our friends, children and people just in our circle of influence. And I know you're doing really cool stuff like this uh, with your family, with your daughter. In fact, uh, I think it'd be really neat to to even share now, like you have done a great job with your investing and you've created a wonderful life for yourself. You don't have to work a job. You own some businesses. You've got income coming in from other investments. And so you've really built uh, what I would call, you know, the the lifestyle investor type of of life and and with intentionality. And so you can pour into your daughter and your wife and your, your other family and friends. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and just lifestyle investing in general. Well, I will say, uh, for example, what I, what I think is uh, what I've decided to do with my daughter that I think is a good way for any parent, and I think it's affordable by, by anybody, and that is the notion that, as, as you probably know, you can't put money in an IRA unless it's earned income, in other words, from a salary or a wage. So um, uh, I think any parent can say, uh, and what you can start working at 14 years old is at legal age. I don't know if it's by state or how that is, but let's say, you know, kid typically gets a summer job or whatever at 14, 15, 16. And to say, look, for every, uh, dollar up to that you earn up to X amount, of course, kids, kid wants to, you know, spend the money, right? I mean, that's the, of you course. want gratification and that's, and that, and I understand that there's nothing wrong with that. But for the parent to say, look, I'll match dollar for dollar into your retirement account, um, what, whatever you earn. And that way, uh, and, you know, if a parent, the maximum for IRA is $7,000, but, you know, depending on one's means, a parent could say, you know, the first $1,000 or $500, or it could be any amount, right? But that, you know, just to give you an example, if you compound out, if you take someone at, uh, say, 15, and um, you compound out 10% a year tax-free, um, you know, that $7,000 by itself without any additional contribution becomes almost a million dollars. So let's say $800,000. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's a pretty big gift to give, uh, you know, that, that probably will affect that, that child's lifestyle and retirement. So 
Um, so that's just a, just a thought there that I think is applicable to anybody. And also it has, unlike the game that I did, the one-year game, it really sets up more of a long-term perspective. And then ideally having a retirement account where you have uh, some autonomy to choose different investments. And then, you know, that becomes a separate conversation about what to invest in. Um, but um, uh, so... Um, By the so, way, I do want to say, I love that. I think that is fantastic, Robert. And you are encouraging and embracing and supporting such great skills of being a long-term thinker, not being, you know, in the moment, short-term, you know, filling your wants, needs, and desires today, but, but uh, allocating something towards that, but giving incentive for the long-term plan and long-term focus. I, I just commend you. That's amazing. You know, I'll, say, I'll also make another kind so I'm, uh, I don't know if I shared with you, uh, so I, I, make, I mentioned to you I was in an investment club, and then actually I started a software company uh, that was focused on investing and investing software. Um, and um, in, 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 during this whole time, I was a member of this organization. It's a nonprofit organization called Better Investing. Are you familiar with it at all? No, much? I'm but not. It's I'm the, not. I believe it's the largest. So I'm on the serve on the. It's a nonprofit, by the way. So I have nothing to to gain out of uh, you know saying good things about it. Um, it's a nonprofit organization, uh, and uh, and I happen to serve on the board now. But the uh, but originally, I mean, they are focused on um, you know I think their dues cost. It, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a mastermind in a way, or it's about collaborative investing, and the dues are like or it depends. You could some some stuff's for free, or it can be a hundred dollars a year, and um, and there are chapters all over the country. You can meet with people in person. You can be in an investment club and sort of invest with you know five or ten other people. Uh, and there's a huge amount of investing education. And I think it's just um, the reason I bring it up. I, I find what the organization does is inspiring. And what they really try to do. I mean, the members are from all walks of life. Some are high net worth, um, but I would say the majority are people who are, are regular savers, and they may not have large incomes, uh, but, and there's nothing more inspiring uh, that, you know, I'll go to one of the conferences and I'll typically try to sit at a, you know, lunchtime sit at the table with, with, with strangers I've never met before. And everybody I'd ask her, so what brings you here? And almost every time it's someone who says, you know, look, I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, if they're, particularly if they're an older person, you know, I was a plumber or I was a teacher uh, or I was, uh, you know, and, and I saved through this organization, through the discipline of saving and investing, my retirement is so much better than I ever would imagine it would be. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, it just means uh, saving $100 a month, let's say. Um, you know, you're not talking about necessarily large amounts of money, but so I think the, uh, that investing is really, um, it's a demonstration that investing is really accessible to, to anybody. Sure, it takes some initiative and it takes some, some effort, but, um, but I find that incredibly inspiring. I love that. And I, I love that you're so uh, giving of your time and your resources to charity. I mean, there, there are many things that you've done. I, I love that, it, you know, sometimes for people when they uh, have earned a good amount of income, it's not as much of a sacrifice to give uh, capital, give money, because you have access to that. Whereas time, that's the real sacrifice because it's finite. And so it's neat seeing that you're willing to do both. And in fact, we were just talking the other day, uh, you know, in one of our investment club meetings, and uh, you were saying, hey, I love the idea of being able to donate to, um, you know, let's say st people that need help in the, in the startup space. And uh, maybe even these are, are individuals that, um, you know, aren't even from here, right? or whatever the case is, like I would love a charity that focuses on helping these entrepreneurs get funded and get off the ground. And, um, and I just love that. I, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts and, and maybe even some of the listeners that, that listen in might know of something because you reached out and got no response. You've got right, money yeah. that you're willing to give and donate right, right, and, right. and people aren't even responding back. Well, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe, you know, spam filters and so forth, maybe I should make some phone calls. But the thought is, and, and I'm really, this is initial stages, but, but I touched on a little bit uh, previously that in a, uh, I think a typical entrepreneur's life, there, there are points where you're, um, uh, for, there's a lot of volatility and there are points of vulnerability. And 
if you can sometimes just squeeze through and survive in the tough periods, um, you can go on and, and uh, you know, continue to grow and compound. And I think, uh, you know, I happen to, to personally have, a, you know, I like immigrants to, uh, to the United States who have that, you know, fervor and energy and, and hard work and, and, and desire to do well, although this is not limited to, to immigrants. It could be anybody, any entrepreneur who wants to make a better life for herself or himself and, you know, reaches the point where everything's about to collapse and maybe uh, relatively, um, you know, uh, not a huge amount of money will just help them kind of get over the hump. Uh, and um, I think it's maybe hard to, so that's just the general idea. What I haven't figured out is, okay, how to, how to find, uh, you know, such opportunities in a structured way. Um, you know, that I don't know, but maybe that's something you and I can talk more about. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, and I had just shared with you an investment that I do in, in a, a VC fund where it focuses on uh, immigrant entrepreneurs. And so this fund only invests in immigrants that have started a company and, uh, you know, they like the, the thesis of that company. And so I, I love that. I love the impact that that has. Uh, number one, on entrepreneurship, but number two, helping people that aren't from our country get a good start in our country, at least from a professional standpoint, um, I think that's so cool. Uh, let's let's transition here because you know we, we, you've done a lot of investing, and uh, I'm curious. One of the things I admire about you, Robert, I think you're one of the most analytical people I know, one of the most detail oriented people I know. Uh, you catch things in contracts that attorneys often don't catch. Uh, so I've been very impressed in, on a bunch of the deals that we've done together, just uh, your due diligence and what you personally put into it, even before getting to the attorneys. You know, we both run our stuff, you know, any deal by our attorneys, that's just good practice uh, mm -hmm. just to get another, you know, get other eyes on it, get other perspectives on it. But um, how did you get so analytical? Like, where did that strength come from? Because you're phenomenal at it. Oh, well, that's nice of you to say that. Um, it, you know, contracts uh, is just something that I just I just enjoy for, for I don't know I don't know what reason. Um, I was really inspired. There's this book that I highly recommend to any investor or any uh, uh, any entrepreneur who's not a lawyer, hasn't had formal legal training. It's called Contracts in a Nutshell. It's used in law law curriculums mostly, and uh, and you know it's funny because. There's a lot of drama in contracts too, because the contracts get disputed and they go to court and it talks about all these stories about how, you know, I don't know, some disaster happens. And, you know, there's, it, it, it's in my opinion, kind of fun reading. And um, the, um, but I think there is a, gosh, I wish there was something in the K to 12 education system about contracts. And, you know, you see it like, I mean, every, every person, you know, these, these, uh, these, uh, what do you call these consents or these sort of license agreements that you get in an app or, you know, the terms and conditions. And, and these are always documents that are, you know, 30 pages long and, you know, consumers are expected to read them and understand them and sign them. I, I think it's, and I, I, you know, I think a lot of people have reservations about this. Is it really realistic to expect the average person to read all these and understand what they're, most people, I think 99% of people, including myself, most of the time just say yes, except if it's, if it's Apple or Microsoft, you know, they're not going to ask me to do something that, you know, like I would, it would be in the newspapers if it was something really egregious, right? So, but I think that it's a, uh, you know, contracts are such an important part of business and frankly of life. And to, uh, to be able to, and even in investing, it's interesting. And I know you've encountered this too. There are a lot of, um, you know, people have been uh, investors for a long time where someone may have a fund and be looking for investors and, uh, they raise millions and millions of dollars, and it seems that the investors don't really read the the paperwork from page to page. And, it's, and it takes long. It takes, if it's 100 pages, it takes time. But and sometimes it's super sloppy. You know, surprisingly, you would think that you know if you're the hundredth investor to sign on, everything's all good. But oftentimes it's not good, and it's 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 um, it's it's concerning. It's, it's disappointing. So I happen to to like doing that. Um, but, um, you know, for understandable reasons, um, it's not enjoyable for a lot of people, for most people. Yeah. And, and that's so spot on. Uh, I mean, I find errors all the time 
And this is not a strength of mine. I'm not as detail oriented as you. It takes me a lot more energy because I don't, I would never say I enjoy contracts. Um, I can do them because I have to do them or more over what I prefer to do is just send them to my attorney and he does them and, and you know, alerts me on things. But um, I mean, and any investor uh, really needs to learn how to at least read a PPM, a private placement memorandum. And so that kind of outlines, it's like the SEC guidelines uh, for, you know, investors who are accredited because the SEC basically has less rules or regulations because they assume that you're more sophisticated. And so it's kind of laid out in a nice little booklet or pamphlet or document um, but there's a lot of nuance to it, you know, between that and the subscription agreements. And so I do think it's very important that you go through it and you at least get the foundational elements of where things are located, what you should look for, where the terms are listed, do the terms match up to what they said they are. Uh, a lot of the times groups don't talk about fees. And so all the fees are listed in there. Any fee that would ever exist, you'll find it. Yes. And so these are the things that, that I know you and I, uh, you know, we've, we've dug through these together and, and found, you know, all kinds of stuff, inconsistencies. And so I think that's important. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, that what's super powerful in that context, and this is what you do with lifestyle investing and the, and you've been very generous with your time and bringing people together uh, and collaborating on investing. But when, you know, multiple people come together to work on a deal together, you know, each person has a different skill set or perspective, and and that's that's really powerful. And I would even say it's even more important that okay, uh, you know, some people, um, you know, the lawyer when you send it to the lawyer, have a lawyer review uh, in the in the percentage of the investment is not a lot of money, but if you're starting out investing, um, you know, paying a lawyer a couple thousand dollars or whatever it is uh, to review a document, that's really prohibitive for when you're starting out. And, um, and so all the more reason I think to develop the skill um, or earlier. Yeah, there's no doubt. And one of the things I write about in my book in the lifestyle investor is that I want to get uh, an education from anyone that I bring on, anyone that's an expert, anyone that's an advisor, anyone that is legal counsel or tax counsel, uh, my goal is to learn. I don't want them to just do my work for me. I want them to explain why they're doing it. So that way I'm more educated for the next time around. And so I know I'm infinitely better at looking at contracts, at negotiating contracts, simply because I've had my attorneys teach me over the years what's actually going on in them. They're not just sending me documents that say, hey, you know, here are the write-ups, sign this. You know, I coach them and say, tell me why we're doing this. Give me the breakdown. Why did, so I see you edited it why did you redline it, right? What, what is, what's yeah. that affording me? Or what don't you like about that? Or what should I be looking at before I even bring it to you? And so that's just so important. I love that you're doing that. That's, and, and that's a really good point that professional attorneys, if you uh, reframe it as their, their educators, as well as, you know, service providers, then that's, I think that's awesome. I think that's absolutely the, the great way to look at it. Yeah, and it helps me justify the price, right? At first it was really tough yeah. to, you know, pay thousands of dollars for legal advice. But later, when I really started looking at it, it was like, wow, well, not only did they help me not lose money in this situation, because if I didn't have a good contract, I would have lost money. But they helped me uh, structure deals better. They helped me uh, be able to use better mechanics and come up with better ideas for structures in the future. So there's just so much where I, I can see that the investment isn't for the work being done, it's for my education and all my future deals. And that has made it a much more pleasant expense for me to pay. So um, you, you and I, Robert, we met at our investment club in Tiger 21, you know, and, and that has just been so fun. There's so many reasons why I love it. I'm curious why you joined and uh, even what your thoughts are on it. Well, I really, uh, I love, I mean, everyone has different styles of, of learning and uh, processing things. So I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I, I my, the, the way that I learn best uh, is, uh, is by collaborating with, with other people who have the same, the same interests, essentially, or the same, or similar objectives. So, uh, you know, so for example, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Decades ago, I joined an investment club to as a way to learn about investing. It was also social and fun. 
Um, and uh, when I uh, was operating a business when I was an entrepreneur, um, I was a member of the organization called Entrepreneur's Organization. Actually, I'm still a member. And that's really kind of like Tiger 21, but it's about operating businesses. It's, it's entrepreneurs who get together every month and talk about the issues that are affecting them and how to solve them and people collaborate with each other. And I would even say that that, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, called mastermind group or peer group, uh, let's say, um, is even more, to me, is more valuable than even MBA, you know, because I feel like for the MBA, I learned a lot of stuff that, was about being a CEO or something that, you know, wouldn't be relevant for 20 years or whatever. And so, but with the peer groups, you know, you are learning stuff that, and the world's of course changing quickly too. You are learning stuff that's relevant to you and to others right at that moment. And people who are uh, kind of in the same, in the same shoes. So Tiger 21 is great because it's like the peer group for entrepreneurs, but it's about, it's a peer group for investors. And, um, and I think, uh, it, you know, something that's, per, that's important to me personally also is sort of nurturing, you know, my friendships and my relationships with people because that's uh, a fulfilling part of, part of life. And, and Tiger 21 is a nice way to combine that. A, a, it helps that we're collaborating with each other, looking at investments, uh, and, uh, but also, you know, the camaraderie that comes with that. That's, that's you know, that sort of kills two, bir two birds, I feel. And I think it's a great organization. Well, I love that. And, you know, I was going to mention this at the beginning because you just recently moved here to Austin. You were living in New York. You were part of our chapter, though, which is really cool. So you'd come in for our meetings, even though you had to catch a, a plane flight to get here. And uh, now you're officially here, which is a testament, you know, to A, the city, B, the group. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's so great. Um, Obviously, there must be some great value if that is the draw and you could be doing it in New York. But I think there are other draws here, you know, moving to Austin based on just kind of what's going on in the world, too. So uh, yeah. we're, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's an honor for me. That's cool. You know, I was thinking about this and, you know, I, one of the things I'm always thinking about is, you know, in, in um, with high, highly driven, highly successful people, it's like, what, what makes them tick? And, uh, and, and then from their standpoint of like the world and what, what does that mean? And what's their purpose? And, uh, you know, what, what is their mindset? I'm always just so curious, uh, what makes people tick and, and, uh, the, the viewpoint that they look at the world from, uh, I'm curious for you, you know, what is what is lifestyle investing to you? Why is it important for you to have cash flow that covers your expenses? Uh, well, that's that's a great question. Uh, the um, uh, uh, I would I, you know uh, figuring out what one wants in life I think is not easy um, for a lot of people. Um, some people know you know uh, just instinctively you know what they want out of life, what they what their lifetime goals are. I admire that. Um, other people, and myself included, it takes it takes time for took time for me, and has is still taking time for me to figure out what that is. Um, but um, I, um, you know, I appreciate very much the relationships in my life, uh, my my family and friends, and um, and and like to, you know, have the uh, the time and and freedom to uh, to nurture that. Um, that really is uh, a, uh, you know, for me, kind of a, uh, a primary thing. And, you know, just um, I like to uh, find, I like, uh, you know, ways to collaborate and ways to help people. And you've, you've been so, so generous and, and, and good at that, Justin. Um, I feel that I have a lot to learn from you on that regard as well. Um, you know, that's pretty much what... Um, you know, I don't have, you know, particular items on my uh, bucket list or anything other than just the, um, and I'm still figuring out what, what constitutes a, uh, a life well lived. You know, it's interesting. Um, I always find some, oftentimes biographies are, um, are very interesting to read, you know, to, uh, to hear how other people thought and how they navigated themselves through life and what their regrets were and uh, what ended up being important at the end of the day. What's interesting though is that most biographies are biographies of famous people who um, are 
you know, and their lives are not that that relevant to my life. I'm more of more of an ordinary person, uh, and um, and I'm kind of you know I'm I'm starting I'm looking right now uh, for uh, accounts of ordinary people who who figured out how to lead extraordinary lives for for them as they defined it, uh, and um, because I think that could be interesting. Yeah, you know, it, it is interesting. I love biographies. And I love nonfiction because I just love to know what makes people tick and what they're thinking and decisions that they make, you know, in stress and in situations that are more relaxed. I, I mean, that to me is like my favorite genre of book, um, you know, and, and so I think it's great because I can learn vicariously through someone else uh, who has very successful habits or a very successful mindset, what they did and emulate that. So I, I think that's cool. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I want to ask you, I, I love asking this of people, uh, and every answer is so different, but um, to you, what does wealth and freedom mean? Um, I think uh, wealth, and we have to define wealth, right? But uh, I think wealth is, uh, is sort of a fertilizer, or it's, a, it's an ingredient of freedom. Um, and um, but the reason I go back to the definition of wealth, you know, one can have a lot of freedom. You know, there are places and lifestyles one can have that are very, that don't cost very much. And one can have a lot of freedom, I feel, without, um, uh, I mean, you know, we're very, uh, our, the average income and wealth in the United States is higher than a lot of countries. Uh, so, so we have some privilege in, in this country. Uh, but, um, so it depends. So I, th I think, uh, you know, one can, uh, but on the other hand, one can have, you know, end up with a very high financial overhead and it requires a lot more to have, have freedom, not to, uh, and, and, not, and, and not necessarily not to work, but to, uh, to although that's a possibility for some, uh, if, if that's important to, for someone, but also to, um, to have more freedom over how one works. Um, and uh, maybe it's not, uh, a nine to five or nine to nine to nine uh, job, but maybe it's something where one's working productively, you know, four hours a day and, and does other things or, you know, other types of work, or maybe there are multiple types of work that, uh, uh, and to have a collage that's, that's fulfilling and, and fits that, that individual need to have that freedom um, is, uh, which is, um, it's not always necessary to have, I mean, one can have a lot of choice and not have money to uh, uh, to finance it, but you have to be more creative and clever about it. If there's some money coming in that you can kind of count on, uh, certainly makes your choices are, are wider in terms of what you can do. Yeah, there's no doubt. You know, money. I, I say this a lot, but uh, you know, money solves money problems. You know, you have a financial problem. Well, you have money. It's going to solve that problem. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it will certainly take care of your financial problems. Yeah, and it also and I'll also add not to take a negative uh, tone, but uh, you know, it creates it creates problems too that are not created with 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 wealth. I mean, you have the uh, uh, you know the maybe it's a little bit cliche, but you know the trust fund kids who. Um, you know, they, whereas a, a normal, um, you know, working person doesn't have that extra glass of wine because they have to get up at 7 a.m. and go to work. And if someone doesn't have to work, you know, they are much more vulnerable to um, lots of vices and unhealthy lifestyles that uh, can be, um, you know, much worse than if they didn't have money at all. Yeah, I think it's a magnifier. I think money magnifies the, the character you have. Uh, the qualities that you have and, and really the person that you are. And so for better or for worse, that is kind of what I see it do. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's interesting. So I'm also curious, you, you've been investing for a while now. You've been an entrepreneur. You have been an investor. You're still an investor. You're still an entrepreneur. But I'm, I'm confident that your investment philosophy or thesis has changed over time. Can you share what maybe that change looks like what it once was what it is now what's different um well a lot of it's uh uh a lot of a stage of life and foolishness of youth um so uh you know earlier in my career i took some really big risks where i could have been completely wiped off out like lost everything financially um and as i mentioned earlier you know not that i haven't hit any big home runs but the uh but i did get lucky uh that i averted disaster 
Uh, and actually, there were some disasters, but they weren't, um, you know, financially catastrophic. Uh, um, and um, and so that's fortunate. So basically, a lot of the change has to do with, um, you know, now I think this is fairly common, and, and also is in, in uh, that that my focus now is more around, you know, not not losing money, and and my returns, my upsides lower today than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, and, um, but I think my downside's also less too. And so I think that's very common, more, I'm more diversified. Um, I spend a lot more time on risk and I'm trying to assess risk. And that's really hard to assess risk. I mean, I think it's just very, uh, very hard to, to figure out there so often there's risks that you don't know about that you find out later. Um, or, um, and you know, sometimes you know about the risk and you just get unlucky, uh, on, on a known risk. So I would say that's one thing: more diversification and more um, uh, and, and, and more conservatism. That's a stage of life thing. Then there's a whole other dimension, and that is the world's changing, and the world we live in today is different from the world that that we live in lived in 20 years ago. And I'll you know just give you one example of that. I even I had a brief conversation about this the other day. There's this book, and I, I read it eight years ago when it came out, but I still think about it a lot. It's called Abundance uh, and um, by Peter Diamandis and uh, Steve Kotler. And it basically, uh, it talks about how acceleration of technology uh, or technology accelerates exponentially. So probably most people are familiar with Moore's Law where you know, computing capacity you know, doubles every 18 months. Um, their thesis is, and they're not alone in this, is that that acceleration happens in almost all areas of technology. And the implications are, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, that fable of the chessboard and the grains of wheat and, you know, how the, uh, the, the I think it was supposedly, I don't know if it's true or not, but the inventor of chess and the king said to the king, will you give me, you know, one grain of rice on the first square and then double it for every square for the whole chessboard. And the king was like, oh, no problem. It's, it can't be that much money. What a small amount of rice. And uh, it ended up being because of the compounding. And so it's like the first half of that chessboard, it doesn't seem like a lot of rice, but at the second half of the chessboard, it really gets to be a lot. And the book argues the same thing with technology and its impact on society, that it will. And the thing that, that is interesting for me is that if, it's, if that's true, then it's really, uh, it has, it's, it's, it'll overshadow. You know, we spend a lot of time in investment circles, or I think people do, Talking about who's going to be elected president, who, what's monetary policy, what's fiscal policy, what's going to happen with trade with, trade with China, um, you know, all these things, um, and uh, what's going on in the bond market, stock market. If this really acceleration really is, this acceleration of technology and productivity through technology could actually uh, trump or overshadow all of these other factors. So they're really not significant in comparison. And we might be seeing, although there's, there, I'm struggling to find direct evidence of it, but you know, people are uh, very, uh, this notion that inflation has been so low in, in, de in developed world for the last 10 years, and economists can't explain it, uh, and, or they struggle to explain it. And um, you know, despite all of this stimulus and all this extra cash being thrown into the economy, so I think that's eventually very interesting. So that would suggest from an investing standpoint, maybe more weighting towards uh, early stage or towards technology. Uh, although some of that, you know, the, the horse is a little bit out of gate on that because these big technology companies have done so phenomenally well. These stocks have done so phenomenally well over the last 10 years. But, um, you know, that, uh, that may continue or maybe even um, accelerate. So, so there's some sort of, you know, um, so there's that side as well in terms of what's going on in the world and what's, what are the trends that or the things that are going to happen that, that, that I or uh, uh, that I'm oblivious to, that I'm not, that are going to surprise me. Oh, I love it. I love your perspective and how deeply you think about things. Uh, you know, it's just, it's fun hearing you share your thought process. That's really cool. Uh, I, I would love to find out um, just one of your biggest failures uh, that you had in your life and what you learned from that failure. Yeah, so uh, so when I was 25, um, I uh, uh, one of my best friends and I. And this was in the early 90s, so the Berlin Wall had come down, and Eastern Europe was in a state of change. And a uh, friend and I decided that we wanted to go to Eastern Europe and and start a, a bagel business. You know, essentially a bagel shop. 
And, um, you know, that's a great example about one can, you know, in one's youth, one has a lot of passion and enthusiasm for things, but sometimes not a lot of rational, not, or a little bit less in terms of rational thought and thinking things through. Um, but that's okay. You know, that, you know, passion can, 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 can offset a lot of um, uh, shortfalls in other areas. But anyway, went out there, uh, opened uh, one bagel shop, had a, um, uh, a, a, a wealthy person showed up at our shop one time and helped us fund, you know, so we, we lost so much money with the first shop that we needed to open, you know, 14 other shops in order to get to profitable. And it was just one, I mean, I could go on and on, but it was just one disaster after another. Clearly, I was not, I didn't have the skill set to, to do that. Um, it was overconfident. I was in a strange country with a strange culture and with, uh, uh, with lots, of, lots of other things going on. So that ended up being, I mean, it survived. It was uh, financially, and it was sold at, at a loss for, for most investors. And essentially, it was financially a disaster. Um, and, um, um, but, you know, in terms of your question, you know, what did I learn? Well, you know, I learned that uh, things are much harder than, you know, it humbled me and it made me, you know, less, I mean, confidence can be a good thing, but it, it, it brought my confidence in check and it made me think more and more. And I think it applies to investing. Okay, what, you know, more of a mindset, okay, what could go wrong? I feel like early in life, for a lot of entrepreneurs, they're just thinking about what can go right. And that's great because it's that optimism that fuels success in a lot of entrepreneurial endeavor, endeavors. But the investor has to be more of, I think, investors have to be more oriented about, you know, what can go wrong. And having things having gone wrong in the past <laughs> helps one to do that, as you pointed out earlier. Oh, I love it. And it's great because there's so many learning opportunities from the struggles and from the failures that really help define who we are today. And I feel like when you do fail early in life, you learn some hard lessons, but early on. So the money that you lose is not the great amounts that you could lose later as you're building your wealth. And so uh, I just think it's great. I love, you know, I love hearing that story. Uh, I didn't even know that about you. That's just such a cool way to start a business, not even in your own country, somewhere else where there's a language barrier, I'm assuming. And, yeah. you know, just so many other, you know, cultural uh, norms that are different than the norms here. That's cool. Well, um, do you have any last thoughts? We're, we're kind of coming to a close. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners here today? No, I think it's just, uh, you know, what you're doing with lifestyle investing is, uh, is incredible. And uh, I've been privileged to be, uh, you've invited me to some of the sessions you've had where you, you know, brought together, um, you know, all sorts of people who uh, have, I mean, they have at least one thing in common that they're they're all eager to learn and to collaborate with each other. And so I think it's just incredible, incredible what you're doing. You've been incredibly generous in, I think, bringing, uh, you know, and it's not, it seems like there are some people who are more experienced, some people are less experienced. It's just, uh, you know, you seem to open, uh, uh, to be open to all types. And I, I really admire that in you. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the kind words, Robert, and I appreciate you having uh, the time to spend with us here on the show. Um, where can our listeners reach out to you or connect with you uh, online if they had uh, any? Oh, I, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not. I'm not on Twitter, but I'm on LinkedIn, Robert Brooker. So that might be might be the best place. Awesome. Well, thanks again for for joining us here, and I just want to encourage our listeners to take some form of action today. Take one step more towards the person you want to be and crafting the life that you desire. Uh, you know, move in the direction of becoming a better version of yourself and, uh, and keep moving forward one step at a time. So thank you all and uh, have a great one. Take care. Thanks, Justin.